Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Union Congregational Church. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. You might notice that we are missing a few familiar faces up here leading the service this morning. Bob Long is away, and we are grateful for Peggy Shaw for leading our music this morning. Dave Shaw is also not here, feeling a little under the weather, and with some COVID in his household is wisely staying away this morning. And lastly, unfortunately, we do not have staff in the child care room. Claudia is away, and Giselle is a little under the weather. So parents, if anyone has an, a child three or younger, you're welcome to use the child care room or bring toys from there into the sanctuary. And we welcome children and their noises of all ages here in the sanctuary in worship. So. Uh, also, on, just on the note of illness, with sharply rising COVID cases here locally, we are recommending that we wear masks in worship once again. So thank you uh, for that. And if you need an additional mask, they are in the back. We have a full and joy-filled morning of worship with a baptism and welcoming of new members, exploring the question of redemption as prompted by the story of Saul. A few additional announcements as we get started. A thank you for the incredible generosity of this congregation and community that has raised almost $25,000 that has been sent directly to United for Ukraine, who have purchased critical medical equipment and already dispatched it to hospitals in Kyiv and Kharkiv over the last few weeks. Next week, at the end of worship, we will close our worship service around the newly built gardens across the street at Parsonage 2. We will have a blessing of the gardens, and we'll hear from Jose German from the Northeast Earth Coalition, who will tell us about how these gardens are connected to food insecurity and sustainability and ways that we can get more involved. Immediately after that, if you're interested in doing more to help our congregation work towards climate justice, I invite you to an informal initial meeting about those initiatives in the Guild Room starting at 11.15 next Sunday. And lastly, as we honor Mother's Day, we have flowers, pink carnations in the back of the sanctuary. And as you leave the service today, we invite you to take a flower. If you are a mother or would like to honor a mother, please take a flower in celebration of the work of love and care that we honor this day. And so as we continue in our worship, I share an opening prayer in lieu of a call to worship from the Brazilian artist and theologian, Jackie Marachin. Please pray with me. Come to be our hope, O oh Jesus. Come to set our people free. From every oppression release us, let us turn to life in thee. Come release from every prison those who suffer in our land. In your love, we find the reason still to live and understand. Come to build your new creation through the road to servanthood. Give new life to every nation, changing evil into good. Come and open our tomorrow for a realm now so near. Take away all human sorrow. Give us hope against our fear. Amen. Let us turn to one another now to share the peace of Christ. If you are with us online, I invite you to say hello in the chat. If you are here in the sanctuary, I invite you to wave or share a sign of peace with your neighbors in the pews. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Peace be with you all. Peace. Peace. Having greeted one another with a sign of peace, we have the special opportunity this morning to celebrate another sign of peace and grace in our midst. So I would like to invite forward at this time the mothers of Mila Goncalves Krasinski up here onto the chancel to join me with Mila and godparents Greg and Shannon Murphy to join us as well. 
So we'll have the family, if you'd like to stand right over here, and I'm going to invite Marcy forward to represent the congregation. And then I would like to invite any of the children who are here in the congregation, if you would like to come forward and sit either in the first pew or here on the chancel steps so that you can see this exciting event in the life of the church. Mm -hmm. Come on up, everybody. Oh, thank you, Walter, for the stars. Yes. <laughs> so, friends, the sacrament of baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of God. Water reminds us of the outpouring of God's love over all creation. It reminds us of the time when John the, Baptist, John the Baptist baptized Jesus. And as soon as Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, the sky opened and the Spirit of God came down like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, This is my own beloved child with whom I am well pleased. And whenever we baptize someone in our church, it is our way of telling them, You are God's beloved child. With you, God is well pleased. And so, Nicole and Juliana, do you desire to have your child baptized into the faith of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, we do. We do. Will you encourage this child to follow in the ways of God's goodness and generosity, pursuing the good, resisting evil, and helping her to become a person of faith and virtue? If so, please say, we will with the help of God. And Greg and Shannon, together with Nicole and Juliana, will you teach this child that she may be led someday to name Jesus Christ as the role model for how to live in love? If so, will you all say, we will, with the help of God? We will, with the help of God. Do you promise, by the grace of God, to be Christ's disciples, to follow in the way, resisting oppression and evil, showing love and justice, and witnessing to the work of Jesus Christ as best you are able. If so, please say, we do with the help of God. And do you promise, according to the grace given to you, to grow with this child in faith, to help her to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, by celebrating Christ's presence, by furthering Christ's mission in the world, and by offering the nurture of the Christian Church so that she may affirm her baptism? If so, will you all respond, we do with the help of God. And to the congregation, do you who witness and celebrate this sacrament promise your love, support, and care to the one about to be baptized as she lives and grows? If so, will you respond saying, we promise our love, support, and care? So, Mila, would you like to come see this water? You want to touch it? It's pretty warm, thank you. Mila, I baptize you in the name of the Creator, in the name of the Christ, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us welcome Mila into this church and into the community of Christ. Would you all like to give her a round of applause for being really brave in her baptism? <laughs> and so I invite the children of the church, if you would like to lead our way down the aisle towards learning centers. And I think Marcy has a gift on behalf of the congregation, of the parents. And as, as we begin our hymn in a moment, I'm going to invite the parents and godparents and Mila to uh, walk down the aisle with me so that everybody can uh, wave and congratulate Mila and you all on this moment. Let us sing. Mm -hmm. You want to come say hi to everybody?
As we enter now into a time of prayer, I invite those of you who are with us online to name any joys or concerns you bring with you this morning in the chat, and I will name those aloud in just a moment here. This morning, we pray with, thank you, Ted. We pray with Joy Mishkin and her father, Mike, as he enters hospice care. We share prayers from Karen Ermler for her niece, Dawn, who is undergoing chemotherapy infusion. We share a prayer of gratitude to those who donated groceries and meals to the Family Promise families this week. Six families, 18 people were fed by our congregation on Tuesday. Are there other joys or concerns that those of you who are here in the sanctuary would like to name aloud at this time? Yes, Ellen. A prayer of joy and congratulations to Dr. Barbara Rice, who got her doctorate in theology yesterday. Let us look to see what prayers our friends online have offered this morning. People of God, let us pray. Holy God, on this Mother's Day, we start with gratitude for you, creator and protector of all creation. Gratitude for all people who provide care, who have labored for new life, whether anyone calls them mom or not. We lift up and celebrate all those who mother, remembering and mourning to those we have lost remembering and holding in our loving prayers all those for whom this day is hard, including those who have lost a mother or child or spouse, those who long to be mothers who have not been able to, and those struggling in motherhood. As we hold the fullness of this day, we question a society that chooses flowers and chocolates over policy and protections. And God, we hold in our prayers all those whose autonomy and selfhood has been diminished this week with the threat of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. As we celebrate motherhood, let us not turn it into a weapon that would limit the human rights of any. Grant us the courage to continue working for full access to health care for all people and an end to poverty racism, and all that separates us from fullness of life in God's kingdom. God, we pray for all those we have named this morning and those we hold in our hearts. We pray for ourselves and the world, that wherever there is sin, there may be redemption. Wherever there is shame, may there be grace. Wherever there is isolation, may there be reconciliation and that wherever God has created a way, may we have hearts and minds that are open enough to follow it. Let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi. 
The scripture reading today is from Acts 9. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. There ends the reading. Thanks be to God. So a few hours ago, when I learned that Dave wouldn't be able to be here this morning, <laughs> he graciously sent me a version of the sermon that he had planned for today. So if this is the greatest sermon you've ever heard, I'll take all the credit, and if you don't like it, those were Dave's parts. <laughs> Who doesn't love a good redemption story? In the book of Acts, we begin chapter 9 with a note that Paul of Tarsus, still known as Saul at this point, is still breathing threats and murder. In chapter 7, Stephen, who is known as the first martyr of the early church, has been stoned to death. Saul sanctioned this killing. Saul has been busy rounding Christians up, binding them hand and foot, and dragging them before the authorities and to prison. He is a collaborator participating in the punishments of innocence. And he now travels towards Damascus, and while journeying, he receives this incredible vision that compels him to change his life. Redemption is an awfully challenging topic for many of us. I'm confident that if Saul were with us today, 
I would have deep misgivings about his potential for positively influencing the world. He did despicable things. And he didn't think deeply and come to realize the harm that he had inflicted. He did not come to repentance by himself. He did not even apologize or beg for forgiveness, as far as we know. And also, that's one of the primary challenges when it comes to redemption. It may sometimes be quick and clean for the person who is being redeemed, but often not quite so quick and easy for those of us who have been harmed. The scriptures say over and over that God is quick to forgive, but most of us are not quite like that. Instant forgiveness does not reckon with justice fully enough for our tastes. And for us modern people, the word redemption seems a bit tired. We're as likely to use it to describe redeeming a coupon as we are in reference to a human being. We've probably given up using it for the most part because it seems to suggest only two fixed states that we could occupy. If we can be redeemed, then before that moment, we are simply unredeemed, guilty and then innocent, trapped and then free, sinner and then saint. And so what does it matter that a couple of thousand years ago, a real jerk saw a vision on the road to Damascus and changed his life? It would, first of all, serve to remind us again that the biblical narrative says over and over and over again that God does not always see people the way that we see people. The redemption in Paul's story is sudden. The forgiveness, we presume, is instantaneous. This is not how I would order things. If I were God, that's not how I would do it. And I know that it is not how I would do it if I were God, because instant forgiveness and sudden redemption is not how I order things now as a human being. I am forever teasing apart what ifs and how comes and if onlys. I can be slow to forgive and begrudging of grace for others. I would make for a terrible God. There's a contemporary story that is a close parallel to Saul's. On the bulletin cover today is a picture of former Liberian warlord named Joshua Blayi. He used the nom de guerre, general but naked, when he commanded an army during the first civil war there. He got that name because he used to go into battle with only his shoes and his weapons. General Butt Naked committed terrible war crimes. He did disgusting, awful, terrible things. He compelled children to do terrible things also. You might look him up if you wish, but take a deep breath before you do. Towards the end of the Liberian Civil War in the 1990s, Butt Naked had a vision. He saw blood on his hands. He turned behind him to find Jesus looking at him. Jesus asked the general to stop being a slave. General Butt Naked said he was the antithesis of a slave. He had power and men serving under him and therefore could not be considered a slave. Jesus replied that but naked as a man of violence was living his life as an enslaved man. He needed to be liberated. Since the time of that vision, the former general has spent 25 years as a missionary, preacher, and teacher. Many of his congregants are former child soldiers who have sought to reform themselves and reintegrate themselves into Liberian society. And some Liberians have forgiven but naked because of the way he has lived his life over the past 25 years. And for others, nothing he does will ever make up for the horror he perpetrated. He's not redeemable in their eyes, no matter what God might think. It's an extreme example. So is Saul, 
who becomes Paul. Then again, while I'm no warlord, stacked against what I feel like I deserve, the forgiveness and opportunities to start again that have been extended to me throughout my life are also surprising. Family, friends, teachers, and even strangers have, on occasion, modeled extraordinary grace and a remarkable capacity to move past the things of the past. When I consider what I think I deserve and what I have actually received, I find myself deeply humbled and grateful. Where would any of us be without others who have been willing to give us a second or third or fourth or 19th chance? Of course, there will always be the inclination to refuse to forgive. And in some cases, it may be impossible to move past the harms. But in the church, we are challenged to balance that inclination to refuse forgiveness against the way in which God and grace appear inclined. There's a well-known church in Colorado called the House of All Sinners and Saints, a nod to the idea that each of us have the capacity to love and righteousness and capacity for harm and brokenness, that none of us is perfect or entirely flawed. They explain at that church that for too long the church has turned its back on the very people who need the gospel the most because they didn't talk right or look right or act right. But as it turns out, we're all those people, sinners broken in need of the grace of Christ, and at the same time we're also the chosen people of God, redeemed in God's infinite mercy and love. Our identity is grounded in the recognition that we simultaneously fall short of God's love and receive it continuously as a gift that has no bounds, as we saw just a few minutes ago. So what might it mean to accept both the good and the bad, the mean and the generous parts of ourselves? What might we be, we be capable of if we could accept God's forgiveness and move into right relationship? Redemption is not just forgiveness, but a turning around. God doesn't just say, oh, it's okay, I still love you, but rather set someone on a course to repair the harm that they have done, to work to bring repair where they have sown hurt. The story in Acts is often called Saul's conversion, but it wasn't really a religious conversion per se, but rather an intervention into abusive behavior a call in to repair the harm and begin to contribute to a positive movement. General Butt Naked didn't just put down his gun, but he picked up an instrument of peace. And of course, we hear these stories today from the end. We can see the evidence of a lifetime, maybe half good and half bad. But we are stuck in the middle of our own messes, regardless of how old you are. And we are stuck in the middle of a sinful and saintly world. In the confusion of how to weigh the good and the bad, we can give thanks that it is not on our scale that these questions rest. We can give thanks that God is God and we are not. And God seems awfully committed to grace, regardless of whether we think we deserve it or not. Amen.
You may be seated. As I mentioned at the start, it is an especially joyful day in the church when we can celebrate both a baptism and welcome new members into our community. So at this time, I would like to invite Bree and Will Corbett and their son Wesley, who are going to be joining our church, along with Brian and Nina and Grant Hennessy, who are serving as their sponsors. Let us welcome them up to the chancel. <laughs> And I'm going to ask Brian to go ahead and introduce uh, the Corbett's. Tell us a little bit about them. We're excited to introduce the Corbett, fam Corbett family. Will, Bree, and sons Wesley and Graham. They lived in the area for three years after moving to Glen Ridge for Manhattan. Will works in finance in the city. And when he's not busy working and commuting, he enjoys golfing and being outdoors. Will grew up in Pittsburgh, where his family was active in the Methodist Church. Bree is a former marketing professional who's now a stay-at-home parent. She loves cooking, reading, and fitness. Bree grew up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, attending a Presbyterian church. Both Will and Bree attended Virginia Tech, go Hokies, <laughs> and are passionate supporters of education and opportunities for young professionals. They also look forward to getting involved in the church's outreach efforts in the community, particularly, the, particularly those pertaining to food insecurity here in Essex County. The Corbetts have been eager to find a church home and community after dabbling in churches in the city and Zooming around Montclair during the pandemic. They're so happy to be joining Union Kong and look forward to meeting all of you. Welcoming new members is an important moment in the life of the community, not just to welcome new folks into our midst, but to remind all of us that the covenant of membership that makes the church a church is an opportunity to remember the promises that we make to God and to one another. So, Will, and I, and I also just want to mention that Graham is at home napping, in case you were wondering where the other child was. That's, uh, you'll meet him eventually. Yes. Right? Is that your brother? Yeah. <laughs> So, Bree and Will, do you desire to enter into the covenant of membership with Union Congregational Church? If so, please say, I do. I do. Do you promise to be Christ's disciple, to follow in the way of Jesus, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to be a witness to the healing ministry and the loving message of Jesus Christ as best you are able? If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. Do you promise, according to the grace given to you, to grow in your faith, celebrating Christ's presence and furthering Christ's work in the world? If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. And do you promise to participate in the life and mission of this community of God's people, sharing regularly in the worship of God, supporting fully the offering of the sacraments of communion and baptism to all people without barrier, and enlisting in the work of this local church as it serves the community and the world. If so, please say, I promise, with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. And will you all, the members of Union Congregational Church, please rise as we express our welcome and affirm our mutual ministry in Christ, in Christ responding with the response that is printed in your bulletin. We welcome you with joy in the common life of this church. We promise you our friendship and prayers as we share the hopes and labors of the Church of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may we continue to grow together in God's knowledge and love, walking together on life's journey. Welcome to Union Congregational Church. And so with this joyful moment and reminder of our covenant, I'm going to offer our benediction and then uh, we'll have the Corbett's and the Hennessy's walk out with me. And I invite you all to join us and greet them in the assembly room with the warm welcome and hospitality that we can offer. So people of God, may you go this day renewed by the promises of a God who sees each person as God's own beloved child. May you know deeply the grace that is offered to you. Simply by being you. 
and may you be reminded of the opportunity to live more fully into that covenant with God and this community. Go in peace this day. Amen.